So, um, good afternoon. Uh, honorable delegates, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Are we all in the same session? Okay, great. So, welcome to the first of several concurrent sessions. Uh, we really value your attendance and participation in this session, which is titled, uh, can we have that? Is there a slide for that? Is there a slide for the session? Kindly put it up. Yes. So, this, the session is titled Enhancing Food Security Using Space Technologies. Now, in order to help us along with this discussion and in the interest of time, uh, I will keep the introductions brief. We have a panel of experts drawn from academia, um, private business, uh, also non-governmental and governmental organizations. Uh, so I will introduce our first speaker and panelist, uh, Dr. Catherine Nakalembe from the University of Maryland. Um, she's an associate professor at the University of Maryland in the Department of Geographical Sciences and her research focuses on food sat, uh, security and artificial intelligence using Earth observation data from satellites and machine learning applications for small-scale agriculture, food security, and risk assessment. Dr. Nakalembe, uh, welcome. Our second speaker and panelist is Mr. Juan Suarez from GNB. GMV is a private um, capital technology business group that is involved in various industries. Uh, Mr. Suarez has vast experience in earth observation uh, applied to natural resource monitoring and management. So welcome, uh, Mr. Suarez. <coughs> Our third panelist is Dr. Kiringai Kamau. Uh, he's the deputy CEO of the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition, Godan. He's also the founder of Godan's uh, program for capacity development in Africa, which hosts the Godan South, South uh, Secretariat at the University of Nairobi's Department of Food Science, Nutrition and Technology. Welcome, Dr. Kamau. Thank you. And our third, actually fourth, panelist is uh, Ms. Husna Mubarak. Ms. Husna Mubarak is the team leader for governance and of land, land and natural resource at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, uh, FAO, Kenya representation. And she manages the land governance portfolio uh, around land, land administration, tenure and management, land use planning, conflict and dispute resolution, policy and legal framework, gender, equality, rights, mainstreaming. She handles a lot, so welcome. <laughs> Ms. Mubarak. And finally, uh, last but not least, uh, we have Ms. Janet Ngesa from the Kenya Agricultural, uh, Agricultural Livestock Research Organization, um, who is an ICT professional, and she's heavily involved with the data management, in, including dissemination of agro information to farmers. So she has um, high-level interactions with farmers on the ground. So welcome, Ms. Ngesa. So the format we shall take for this presentation, is, uh, sorry, for this session, is we shall have the two presentations by our speakers, uh, Dr. Catherine and also Mr. Suarez. And then we shall have um, a panel discussion for around 20 minutes, but uh, as you can see, the panel was here on time, so we'll try, try and keep it moving. Then uh, we'll have a Q&A session, so I would request, kindly request that you hold your questions until the end, and we shall address them as, uh, at the end. So, um, Dr. Nakalembe, welcome.
All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a good lunch. Um, my name is Catherine Nakalembe. I'm an associate research professor at the University of Maryland, and I will talk about uh, the NASA Harvest Africa program. Uh, this is under the broader Na NASA Harvest program, which is NASA's agriculture and food security uh, program, and it is intended to support integration and utilization of Earth observations for agriculture monitoring, working with stakeholders, stakeholders at different levels, and it is managed by the University of Maryland, and under this program, I'm the Africa program um, director. And so this is sort of an overview diagram. It really just generally applies to all of Earth observations. It's not um, as accurate as I want it to be, but it just, and we've kind of had a, a good overview already in the morning. We have satellites collecting data on Earth every day, everywhere. Uh, we combine um, ground truth data with satellite observations to characterize things about the planet and in this particular example it's purely about agriculture we extract information for example on cropland crop type and um, we have information from satellites uh, including rainfall temperature and forecast and then that can be used at the farm level but can also be used for decision making for example for early warning so I like to show this thing even though I'd like to improve it significantly oh, I keep improving it every time and as part of the Africa program priorities, we want to improve the systems where you can access information, for example, for crop conditions assessments. Uh, we want to advance the methods that, are in, that, are, that inform the data that are in those systems. So you don't want to use a model that was developed, I don't know, 100 years ago for monitoring cropland right now, because it might not be able using the best available data sets that are um, available. And then the third is, uh, transferring capacity, working with national organizations that want to use these tools within the context of their institution. Um, the other is, of course, partnerships. Uh, it's been said already today, you can't do all of this uh, as one institution. So some examples of some of the um, EO data systems that we primarily use as part of our program. We have the Global Culture Monitoring System. It, you, anybody, anywhere can literally analyze what's happening with cropland pretty much everywhere. Uh, we have, uh, so this is just a few of some of them. One of the most common, most popular one that's used um, is the GLAM system. And then we have the crop monitor system in the bottom right. These are custom developed systems. They were developed as uh, part of the Global Culture Monitoring Initiative, uh, GeoGLAM, and uh, customized for individual countries. And the examples that I'm showing here is when you zoom into Kenya or work on the Kenya platforms. So in terms of the methods, I'm going to go really quickly. We are working actively on uh, improving methods for collecting ground truth. We can't take information out of satellites unless we have ground truth information uh, to validate, train, and develop more models. And so we're doing some really interesting, really cool approaches that are specifically context relevant for within Africa. Um, the next is, oh, I want to show this example from a previous one. We have this project called Helmets Labeling Crops, using motorcycle drivers to collect data, and we're currently trying to do, these campaigns are actually ongoing in these countries in, um, in Africa. The other is, once we have some ground truth data from multiple places, we're coming up with smart ways of making the ground truth data sets machine learning ready and accessible to others. So we're compiling uh, what we're calling Crop Harvest, which is a global data set of where there is ground truth information that you can use to develop, a, let's say, for example, a cropland map or a crop type map. Um, with that information, we can develop crop land maps and crop type maps. And uh, we're investing a lot of time in developing machine learning based approaches uh, to extract and develop crop land information, but in a scalable way, as well as making the data, the tools, the methods, all of them publicly available. So everything that I'm showing here can be accessed. Um, including the papers, the guidance documents, as well as can be run for multiple countries. So this is an example result for a 2019 Kenya cropland map using our what we're calling a, a crop mask workflow. And we're doing crop type mappings, an example of a common bean map for Kenya. It's a probability map, what the machine learning model is predicting as bean, common bean in Kenya. It combines that crop, uh, uh, crop harvest data set where we have examples of 
a common bean, we run the model and then evaluate it based on data from within Busia County in this case where we had uh, common bean data. We are also trying to develop methods for delineating field boundaries they are important for error estimation, for farm level management or assessment and it's something that we're working heavily on using computer vision approaches, uh, image segmentation as well. Uh, we are spending a lot of time on yield estimation, so we have a scalable approach for forecasting yield using remote sensing data. I added these images to show you an example of what it takes to collect data. This was done in, uh, this is being done by the Ministry of Agriculture here in Kenya. They're collecting ground data on yield and doing that at scale is incredibly expensive and time intensive and so but combining a little bit of that with satellite remote sensing we can get a better understanding of what's happening in a much larger area. Uh, an example of our workflow that integrates earth observations, ground truth yield data um, going forward. An example of how those products can support uh, decision support systems is this with the uh, Using that GeoSIF model, it's a yield forecasting model, we've been able to support a regional food balance sheet, for example. Uh, capacity, we do a lot of training, so I'm going to go really quickly through the next slides. Across multiple countries, with different individuals, different organizations, including universities. Uh, our partners, this is just a few of some of the partners that we work with. The list is much bigger than, than this. Uh, in terms of impact, uh, the crop monitor system that I showed before has been used and integrated for monitoring within Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, um, Ethiopia, and Mali. It's built off of a, a global crop monitor system, and a lot of these systems are operational, including the one in Kenya that's being managed by the ministry. An example of the impact of having this system is the ministry is able to keep track of things that are happening in all the counties. Um, and are reporting on extreme events in a way that's much, uh, much more understood and shareable across multiple scales. And then in terms of the crop monitor uh, impact, this is an example from this year. The ministry is coordinating, by coordinating with the different counties, they're able to, you know, keep track of where uh, interventions have been implemented as well as share information with the network of extension agents that contribute towards the crop monitor. Enabling risk financing is an example from Uganda. Using the GLAM system, they were able to develop this disaster risk financing program that over the five years of the program, they saved over $11 million by providing early warning using the system. Aspirations of our program, this is my last slide, is we want to increase access to using deep learning approaches for uh, crop monitoring. We want to do more use-inspired work, so not, not throwing out and producing more data sets and products, but they have a purpose. And then growing our training program, having stronger real partnerships, and um, yeah, I guess the last two are the same, a stronger and equitable partnership so that we're working together. And we are, for example, trying to figure out a way of working with the Kenya Space Agency in multiple, multiple things. Thank you. So thank you so much, Dr. Nakalemba. Now, um, I think for those of you who are here for the plenary session, there was a lady who asked a question about why go to space. And this session directly addresses that um, in a sector that is very close to our hearts. So the next speaker um, is uh, Juan Suarez. And I just wanted to say that apart from being in the private sector, he has also a background as a researcher. I think it was Ka. The University of <laughs> Ah, the University of Castilla La Mancha. So welcome, Mr. Suarez. I'm sorry because I beat theft of this <laughs> I so that I tried so I reside in Spain. I work across Africa. Thank you very much. Uh, Sure. So, uh, Africaltos. In Africaltos, we wanted first we stay on the on the motto, on the, on the project. Our aim is food security in Africa. And I think for, uh, I'm glad to to have had uh, Catherine before me because about technologies, methods, and so on, she already introduced. So it's very good. So it's easy to me to go over the presentation. So what is Africaltos? Africaltos is a partnership formed by 
17 uh, institutions from across Europe and Africa, because from the beginning, uh, what is more important, we wanted to brought into the consortium the knowledge and the wisdom from Africa. It's not about jumping with the parachute on science and technology, doing something in the, from the, the laboratory to uh, deliver something that at the end perhaps is not addressing real challenges. So keep this in mind because it's one of the, of the drivers for, for us. So the goals and objectives of the, of the project is to, in principle, uh, for sure, uh, contribute to the enhancement of food security in Africa with the support of remote sensing. At this moment, I would say that I would remove the part of remote sensing, even though we are in an aerospace uh, conference in uh, earth talking about earth observation, but it's not just earth observation. There are many ingredients put in this, uh, into, the, the, into, into the, the receipt, okay? To deliver at the end something through a decision support system, uh, to deliver information which is actionable and addressing real real life needs. So you know that uh, food production poses different challenges and this is composed by four components which is the food availability, the access to food, the utilization by the individuals and the stability of these uh, three components a long time. And the good is that using earth observation at uh, and geospatial technology, we are able to cover at least the part on the availability and, or for sure, the part on the, on the, on the stability of food availability in a, in a region. We can also address access, access to food through, I don't know, GPS positioning, so on, so on, so on, but it's not the matter or, or at the end, the goal of the, of the project. So, in the concept, as already mentioned before in the previous presentation, we are integrating data coming from the ground, coming information provided by the final users. We are for sure using earth observation data, mostly or not mostly, just using open data. In the in the case, we got this mandate from the from the European Commission, who's, who's funding the the, the project. We are integrating data coming from different in, uh, sensors, meteorological stations. We are feeding or forcing uh, models, different crop models, deterministic, uh, machine learning, deep learning, you know, all this, all this stuff uh, with, with this data. We are also addressing the short-term weather forecast in case is missing or entering into another uh, time schedule or time, yeah, in the sense that we are providing seasonal forecast or variability of seasonal forecast to climate and long-term kind of climate scenarios. So you see, we are providing all of this, but in the center of, again, the, the users, because it's not just the African participants, but their contribution like uh, beacons attracting uh, the national users of these uh, countries in where we are developing the, the pilot programs, the pilot projects, because we need their participation. It's not about having just data coming from satellites, sensors, or whatever. We can provide from our laboratories uh, information in the, in the form of data more elaborated. We have some knowledge in sometimes, but we really addressing real these this, this needs, needs of the active participation in a co-design exercise, a co-development exercise of the final users. So then we are getting to the core, is addressing real needs. And these real needs are for different, uh, at the end the target is to, to sustain food production which is mostly pro, um, producing in Africa by smallholders, but Getting one by one is not attainable. That's why we are working together with different key agri-aggregators, agri the public sector, concerned about policy making, uh, implementation of programs, the assessment of the results of those programs, of the well-being of the populations. Also, with the agribusiness sector, including associations of uh, smallholders or cooperatives, there are really the ones producing 
on, on, on the ground, but also these private business providing teeth or providing fertilizers that want to uh, somehow improve the production of food and at, while at the same time uh, feed the lice and their, their, their customs, customers. For sure, we are working or targeting the civil society and NGOs who are delivering most of them on the ground. Um, the financial and insurance uh, sectors, which are key for the for the improvement of food security, because somehow if the farmer gets a uh, digital ID, then he can get a loan, can be sustained, you know, invest, reinvest in food production, get savings to invest in the, in the on the improvement of their of their means and so on, and the academia, because at the end the youth is, are the ones who will be uh, taking over the effort on sustaining this kind of activities. It's not just uh, agriculture, but all these uh, yeah, uh, activities around food security. So uh, what we have in the back end is an uh, engine for the services, for using crop models, land strain models, hydrological, meteorological, climatic models, and so on, but I don't want to get into it. So, working together with our with the users of the project, we are delivering in this moment, and I'm missing this, this, in this slide one, one of the services, which is capacity development. But uh, seven information services that uh, are mixed to serve different specific purposes that are implemented for some key crops in, uh, in the continent, across the, the continent, including livestock, and through uh, the eight, well, it's not eight, but ten national use cases that are being implemented and de deployed at this moment through the, through the platform. We have a, a platform which is very important to us because it's uh, like the window we have for the, for the public, but for sure, we can remove the platform, but at the end, we have the, the services that can be combined, or we can unplug one of the services and put another one which is working better, for sure. So we are so flexible to, to integrate at the end the whole value chain within uh, Africa Altars. Because we are thinking about sustainability. Sustainability is based on trust, is based on plans, on co-branding, and so on, so on. But yeah, at the end is about collaboration and putting all these efforts we have together because our vision at the end is Africa just to become like a food security innovation hub for, for Africa, including not just information but good practices and uh, case examples and means to others to create added value on top of what we are providing or what we are mainstreaming through Africa Altos. So I uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I'm scared. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Mr. Suarez. And we shall now move into the um, panel discussion session. Uh, again, as we move along, kindly uh, formulate your questions. We shall have a Q&A session at the end of this. So um, just to start us off, um, I have a question that I will address to Ms. Husna Mubarak. Um, food security is a serious concern. What are the opportunities to address the situation using space technology? Uh, Ms. Mubarak? Thank you, and uh, a good afternoon to everybody. Uh, once again, congratulations to Kenya Space Agency for pulling this uh, together and uh, really promoting uh, technology and a specific space technology to be able to really look into the development agen agenda at uh, regional and also even national level. My name is Husna Barak. Um, I work for Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, importantly uh, to note is uh, the mandate for FAO uh, in regards to ending hunger and of course uh, uh, improving of uh, nutrition 
uh, increase around uh, uh, agricultural productivity, but most importantly, in regards to strengthening surveillance, research, and en enabling good practices uh, to, pro uh, to promote uh, responsible governance at all, at all levels uh, at, uh, around uh, food and nutrition security. So opportunities um, are quite uh, heavy, and actually I'll, I'll just look into what uh, we are doing and working in partnership in ve uh, at various uh, level. And uh, one of the, uh, looking at our mandates, and uh, one of some of the tools uh, we've really been uh, using and promoting uh, 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 within agriculture, cuts across uh, early warning systems to aspects of uh, productivity, but also importantly uh, in regards to uh, extension services e voucher systems and uh, and farmers uh, registration and uh, one of them is uh, uh, the predictive uh, livestock early warning systems which uh, we working across to really look into movements but forage uh, monitoring and uh, uh, most importantly aspects of of drought and uh, I think for, for, for a while, um, during even during the uh, pandemic, COVID, uh, most of you heard about the, the locust, the desert locust. So some of these uh, systems are used actually to, to, to manage and control the same. But also uh, leveraging around uh, extension services, uh, farmer registration and, uh, and e-voucher systems. Uh, which is a build-on uh, module that is the Kenya Integrated Agriculture Management Systems, KIAMIS, which is still being rolled out. And I think that is one system which, uh, for Kenya specifically, if you ask how many farmers we have, uh, it becomes uh, a, whole, uh, a whole debate. So this is one of the systems we try to use so as we can leverage on uh, what is already available, but also importantly, to be able to, to have data uh, so as we can, it can be used for, for various uh, mandates. Uh, this actually aligns is not only a system, but it's whole time in regards to use of the various technologies, including uh, the GIS. I know we've been working very closely with, uh, with S3, RSA, RCMRD, and uh, others. And the earlier uh, panel also you had about what is happening in, uh, in, v in Vihiga as, as pilots to so many of our work, uh, how we can use that uh, technology to leverage on this uh, system and be able to uh, inform but give out uh, data. Also, one, one of the other things which is around uh, land tenure, and I think this forms the factor or when you talk about agriculture and food uh, and nutrition security, the aspects of tenure uh, becomes a whole uh, lot. So I know there has been in Kenya the National Land Information Management System rolling out. Uh, it's still a big process, but I think at the moment all these other technology are leveraged and uh, be built on together and layered upon each other. Uh, that already gives out a wholesome approach to, to when we are discussing food and nutrition security. And I think these are, are not only at a top level, but also down to the, to the, to the communities to be able to get the nitty gritties, the spatial, and all the other data uh, information required to be able to plan for, for development. But also around, uh, around the same is uh, the specificity around uh, ecosystem management, uh, ecosystem restoration. I know we've been working around uh, carbon monitoring uh, uh, within, the, within the region, uh, but also importantly to, to, to leverage with other, with other technologies in this. Some of the, of the things which I really need to point out uh, here is uh, in regards to the various gaps which uh, are still in, uh, I mean, uh, being discussed or uh, they're emerging, but also in so many ways we call them challenges, we're still not yet uh, there in regards to, to gi giving out of uh, quality data and information despite all these uh, technologies, but also importantly in regards to coordination and integration uh, where 
all, all sectors from private uh, to, to government be able to coordinate uh, for sustainable uh, processes. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much for that very detailed um, perspective from the non-governmental perspective, isn't it? So I will ask the same question of Dr. Kamau, and this I suppose will be the academic perspective. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think there are diverse opportunities uh, on uh, matters to do with um, food security and the concerns around it. I come from the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition, Gordon, and our focus is uh, helping governments to identify how data associated with agriculture and nutrition is easily findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And when you actually come to talking about uh, now use of satellite data, one of the biggest challenges that uh, you find, and which I would dare say that uh, whenever you, you find a challenge, there is an opportunity, is do we know how we, uh, land has been used in the past and what are the potential that it has? So land use, uh, you find opportunities in mapping that. So the satellite infrastructure, uh, the, we have uh, satellites that uh, span, span uh, around the group and you will find uh, every five days, for instance, you will uh, get uh, some indication of what is happening on the ground. So uh, the potential for rad use is uh, very important to help you with assessment. The other one that we, we find interesting is the one on uh, monitoring of activities that are happening in the uh, agricultural ecosystem. So you will find that uh, you will be in a position to monitor activities as are happening on uh, a day-to-day -day basis, um, which gives you an opportunity also to capture whether uh, there, there is uh, challenges associated with weather variations. Uh, when, you, when you see a cropping failure, you will be able to detect that using the satellite infrastructure. It's an opportunity that you actually can do with developing uh, solutions around that. And then you have uh, the predictive dimension, which is uh, what is currently being used very much uh, amongst the many young people who are developing applications and institutions that have come uh, with a predictive uh, dimension of uh, solutions around agriculture. And so you will find that uh, there are opportunities in uh, supporting the management and prediction and more so creating of uh, predict technologies associated with uh, AI and uh, machine learning technologies. Uh, you will find that uh, universities today are very heavily involved in promoting students to create uh, devices that help in capturing of the data to ground truth whatever is happening, uh, whatever data is being captured from, from the satellite, and then development of the algorithms that integrate these two. So I would say that um, there are diverse opportunities that you can bring in, and we can mention, of course, there are, there are also opportunities in, in uh, telling us whether we have uh, sufficient rain coming so that you can uh, effectively uh, give an early warning around what is, uh, should be the, the precipitation ex expected in a particular period of time. I want to say that that is uh, all that I can say on that one. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kamau. Now, uh, I've been requested to make a correction. Now, the Food and Agriculture Organization is not a non-governmental organization, but an intergovernmental agency, or UN agency. So I think, uh, is that accurate, Ms. Mubarak? Okay, so um, moving on, okay, just to summarize what uh, Ms. Mubarak and Dr. Kamau have mentioned, that there are opportunities, and the opportunities uh, are dependent on our exploitation of the available technology. Now, I want to address the next question uh, linked to that aspect to um, Ms. Ngesa on what are the limitations? We know that there are opportunities, but what are the limitations and challenges faced with the utilization 
of Earth observation data in addressing food security? Okay, uh, I want to thank you for that opportunity. Okay, as Janet, I work with, uh, I work for CALRO. CALRO is a research organization and uh, we have highly integrated the ICT in CALRO and we also have a, a farmer database where uh, we have a big data about farmer information and we disseminate information to these farmers. So uh, we have uh, an online integrated platform that is called Kaop. It uses geodata to, from the satellite to generate a real-time information that is being sent to farmers. This platform also, it can give a prediction of, uh, about weather information for the next 15 days based on the location where the farmer is. So we are really uh, concerned with the space data, space technology. But still, there are quite challenges and limitations that we are still facing. Uh, one that I can say is um, getting high resolution data, it is still a challenge. The data that we are currently using, I say it's not that high resolution image, imagery. And uh, if you can manage to get a high resolution data, they are quite expensive and also commercialized. Another thing also, you find that uh, most farmers in Kenya, they do intercropping. So uh, intercropping becomes a, a bit challenge. When you want to train the model, it is still a challenge. And also because of um, another point, because of farm fragmentation, that one also is still a challenge in Kenya. You find farmers owning small parcels of land, so it becomes challenge getting a high resolution image and also data. Another challenge that I can still say it is uh, dealing with satellite data really need high computing power, which is still a challenge. So those are some of the things that I can uh, note out. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Now, I think uh, Mr. Suarez, you have also had the experience uh, in Africa uh, using Earth observation data. So what challenges have you encountered? Okay, first challenge, I would say that uh, for the uptake of uh, Earth observation data um, services is first is great awareness. I think one challenge we have as a community practitioners of the observation is create awareness, not about the sat satellites. Everyone has a mobile phone with uh, Google Earth or whatever. I don't know. I <laughs> wanted to put this the, the trademark. But uh, create awareness about not Earth observation, but the use of Earth observation. And which, uh, uh, what can Earth observation bring back from out from the investment that can be made. So just to put an example of this, I was in a conversation with the Ministry of uh, Environment in Spain, um, talking with uh, a lady in charge of water management. We have a huge problem with Camelot in the Guadiana River. Camelot is like a water jet in the in the Lake Victoria. And they were not aware that if simply like running uh, two lines code in Python, we can extract and monitor come out every five days in, in the Guadiana River. So it's about creating challenge, I, creating awareness. This is the challenge first. And the second is to create capacities. I, I should st stick to, the, to my, my slides. So it's also create capacities within the, those making decisions on the uptake of uh, earth observation because the more acquainted are them about earth observation and geospatial data science, the more, more interested will be on implementing and on uptaking and sustaining a long, a long time this. So I see this 
not just in Africa, but also in Europe, in Spain, at least where, where I live. So these are, to me, the, the two main, main questions. So a part is the access to the data, find, findable, accessible, and so on, so on. But I think it is already solved through IT, so through standards, through guidelines or for open research and so on. But it's not an issue. The issue in this is on our side on implementing really these good practices. And we have guidelines and means to do that. Well, okay. So I know if I'm addressing the whole question, but I think it's my, my point. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I think um, we can agree that the challenges that you're facing are quite different uh, from the private sector perspective compared to the government sector um, perspective. So um, in line with that, um, what is the role? I think I'll give a minute because um, we all exper experience challenges when it comes to the use of earth data, uh, earth observation data for food security, isn't it? So um, what is the role of local communities in your perspective towards one? I think um, okay. we can, st yeah, so, we can start yeah. with you. And then. Okay, so the local communities were at the end, they are the beneficiaries from this, all, all the services. So I, I see the, uh, the, the local communities and the co-design, or, or if we go before the co-design, on the space in the needs. So I need to, I don't know, to feed the, the, my goats, and I move across because I'm a herder, and I need to also to know where can I put water for the, for the, for the herd. So we, the role of the local communities is to express these needs because we as uh, practitioners or, or industry or academia implementing services, at the end what we took is these needs and through engineering we put this into requirements, uh, the requirements on technology, requirements on, on uh, science, on capacity development, on, on information. But at the end, we are yeah, just doing what we know to do. But we need to, 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 to really address those needs through yeah, requirements, because what we understand or what systems uh, understand. And we see this, this role. And also, within these local communities, it could be great if we can ha have at least the, the model farmer or the model herder that can be followed by the others. Okay, this is working, because at the end, perhaps they're receiving just a SMS or, or a, I don't know, a message to the, through the radio. But if this is working, that's trustable, because it's addressing what we need. So we move to the other area in the blah, blah, and so when we were able to fit the, the, uh, our ships. Yeah, that's, that's the, the reality. Okay. Perhaps it's biased, because I'm I'm coming to the great north. I'm surprised because I'm the, the, the unique coming from, from, from Europe. So uh, I rather prefer something, some, someone from Africulture's African delivering today. But okay, I, I've been invited and very, I'm very glad to, for this. I'm very thankful. But I, I perhaps I'm biased on my view on the role of the, because I lack of the real knowledge. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, now, Dr. Nakalembe your perspective um i think you know it's sort of a combination but i would kind of flip it um it's not what the role of the local community is it is if you think about it f from a research perspective as building um youth inspired research you start with a local community it's not def you know putting them in your if you think about it as a lego like then we'll put the local community in the context of the technology um, so kind of working backwards, I think Juan gave a really good example. If it's a, a herder, what do they want? And then you work backwards and try to address the system. Bec you also mentioned, you know, we have a sufficient amount of tools, data sets. There are definitely solutions to solve. So if you think about Cairo being um, the organization for which this development is being done, 
you have to define it from what is Cairo wanting to do, where does Cairo stand, and what tools can get them to reach their end user. And then Cairo would work it backwards. We work with pastoralists. They need this and this and this, and then it kind of uh, merges backwards. Um, so rather than a top-down, um, since we have enough top-down things, we need to work from the bottom up. Uh, a really good example, which goes to some of the challenges that were discussed before, is that um, you hear from machine learning and earth observation people that we need training data. We need a lot of training data. And the solution for training data is not, um, I, in my opinion, I should say, people driving around in SUVs you know, uh, to go to villages collecting data. The solution might just be to work with existing institutions within the local communities, county extension agents, uh, uh, universities that are within those regions to actually do the data collection, but that feeds into a broader context. So it's not as just data collection to produce a fantastic product, uh, but it is data collection to meet a specific need for that specific community. I'm 100% certain that um, a county extension agent is a much better position to collect the right data than I am uh, in a much more efficient way. So, you know, working, considering the user as a way of inspiring what you do, I think is really important. Okay, thank you so much. So, it, are there any divergent views or additions? No, not quite divergent, but I think uh, one thing which uh, is noticeable here even from what uh, the two have talked is, is for them, about them, you know, with them. Because uh, definitely uh, whatever is done, it has to, uh, even the, in terms of uh, the quality, what exactly are we looking at is from the community side. So customization of different aspects, what will fit them is what is, is important. And that's why the, the, the role for community is quite uh, very huge, not only in terms of data collection, but also in terms of progress, monitoring, and you know, uh, giving out information all the time, but also in ensuring that the same information is accessible uh, by them at, uh, at whatever time they, are, they require. Thank you. Yes, and, and maybe I, I can add, um, the dimension of uh, using pharma organizations uh, as the nexus of data sourcing, given that agricultural activities at the grassroots, particularly when you have to say that uh, you, you have uh, already mapped that this region has uh, this uh, product or produce. Now the next thing is, can that be used if we, we mapped and showed that uh, the potential of that area is so much? How do you ensure that uh, what the farmers are doing now aggregates to actually demonstrate that uh, really what was projected because we predicted using our geospatial uh, uh, intentions, uh, that is actually what has been realized or there is a valiance. And then you can be in a position now to enhance your agricultural practice on the basis of uh, mapping that you actually did to predict how much has been collected and consumed and then you are also now uh, seeing that, uh, yes, the prediction and what is happening on the ground. So the farmer's transactional engagement gives you now another parameter of ground truthing what indeed you captured on the satellite uh, imagery. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I think um, to summarize, basically what we are all saying is the farmer is integral to Basically, the local community, they're integral to our use of earth observation data. And I think for the audience, that um, the question may be, uh, the entire panel, what we have discussed has to do a lot with um, crop production. So maybe what I bring in is, um, what are the emerging technologies that can be used, especially now with livestock production? Uh, with respect to earth observation. So maybe one can start. Yeah, so the question is on the, on the technologies, you mean, yeah. So I think <laughs> technology is, is there. So, but uh, we are addressing, talking now about the data science. Uh, we're talking about uh, drones, multi-platforms, integration, data fusion. So, technologies are there. Um, 
I think that uh, delivering uh, at the end relies on the let's say on the ner and on the energy this the technology is consumed. So I mean, so we have satellites, but uh, we have uh, tons of petabytes of of data. So okay, the technology is there to store the data, but getting the data, storing the data, spending the data has a cost. So it's not, I'm not talking about technology actually. I'm talking about, yeah, the cost of the technology. If we are talking about uh, implementation, for example, machine learning, some cases are super specific and very local. They are consuming time, they are consuming energy in terms of, okay, technology is there, but again, we need to do something that is sustainable and technology must be also sustainable in the in the sense that we need to be to get funded in kind we could, we need to be get funded with money to sustain these activities so i don't think the hurdle is on technology the the hurdle is more on the how to sustain the application or the delivery what we can do as a community I see, I say, the one thing here and you there and the others outside. So, yeah, how can we sustain this technological de development? So I see programs long, the good is that we have long-standing programs, like Copernicus, the Lancet programs, uh, programs like Harvest funded by NASA in the long term and so on. But yeah, is that enough to to really address a challenge like food security? Yeah, I think that, well, it's a mix. I, I, I don't think I, I give an, put an answer, but a question on top of the question. So I'm sorry for that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Catherine, finally, before we take questions from the audience. I think um, you've heard about, you think you've heard the word machine learning AI a lot. Uh, this already uh, from the panel in the morning. And um, there's this assumption that the machine learning community knows what they're doing automatically about a lot of things. And there's also the other assumption that we just take what they do. And I work with a lot of machine learning people. It's, I, it's even in my bio. So um, what I think uh, the community themselves are recognizing, there are lots of consequences, you know, ethics, uh, about what people's data are used for. So it was discussed in the morning. We develop a model for, let's say, crop type mapping. What are the negative, what could the negative outcomes be for a farmer? You might not think about it. Sometimes you say, oh, but the satellite data can't hurt anybody. We map crops, that's it, you know, whatever. But um, to use this example, you might find that a private company uses this as a way of buying really cheap produce from the farmer, so that actually disadvantages the farmer. And that could be absolutely 100% enabled by machine learning and earth observations, because everybody can see everywhere. And so um, this is um, really critical, it's really important, um, and, um, and it is really exciting. There is a lot of interest uh, using computer vision for field boundary identification, for disease detection. So it's really, really exciting. And uh, in terms of uh, the machine learning community, they are interested in working on more real world problems. You hear this a lot, rather than toy problems. So rather than counting cats in pictures, uh, it is about like detecting disease. Uh, it, doesn't, it shouldn't stop at detecting disease. I think the other is while we're getting better products, better processing, more satellite output, uh, one of the critical thing is about communication and packaging. So while we can produce really fantastic maps, put them up on a website, while anybody, in quotes, anybody can go and analyze conditions with one of the systems that I showed, that information needs to be packaged and communicated within the right medium that the farmer you want to reach um, can access it. And so that part is you know, largely um, not done or done really well. And I think it's something that needs to be 
you know, on the top of our minds. Like, how do we, how do we convert these pixels into potentially a pharma program that tells them this is what's happening and a pharma actually does that. And so I think those are some of the things that I, I personally keep thinking about. Yeah. Okay, so thank you so much. So I think uh, we're in agreement that the opportunities and the technology exists for exploitation of earth observation data towards solving food security issues. But there are also emerging technologies and the technology as Juan pointed out is still that true. Um, deal with those challenges. So we shall take two questions from the audience um, so that in the interest of time we keep the session brief. So questions? The, the lady from Calro, I'm asking this because uh, I am not agree very much with uh, what she said. Uh, actually, you said about the special resolution, no? You said that uh, we need higher uh, spatial resolution. Then, please, which resolution do you need? Why 10 meters is not enough? So I like from you something more specific on the spatial resolution and the reason why 10 meters, for instance, are not enough. It's at 30 meters, but uh, if we can get uh, to three meters, there or even below, that one can be more accurate and high. Thank you. I can, um, I can maybe add to the question. Um, so majority of crop fields within Eastern Africa are very, very small. So even at 10 meter resolution, you can't actually see a field boundary. You're always absolutely almost aggregating. And so even though 10 meters works really well for Europe, it was, you know, if you're looking at Sentinel-2, if you're looking at Landsat, it was built for the U.S. 30 meters is perfect for the size of fields in, um, in, in the U.S. Fusing that data with other data sets works really well. Within what we're trying to do, we sometimes fuse it with um, planet data at 3 meter resolution. But if you were to actually really look at a map, you can't do any field scale type analysis. You can't disaggregate what's going on in a specific field. And going to the point that she made earlier about having mixed crops, you not only need higher resolution, you need hyperspectral data. And you might even start thinking about things like LIDAR, you know, to, just, to know whether it's, uh, I don't know, maize mixed with beans versus uh, something else. And so, you know, it's, it's something that if a, uh, a satellite is designed for smallholder agriculture, it might need to be that, or otherwise the agriculture has to change to fit the satellite. So it's already been said and done and known that large-scale agriculture is actually not sustainable. So African agriculture can't become like U.S. agriculture or European agriculture. Maybe there might be an in-between. And it might not be necessary to go, you know, sub five meter, but maybe once every year, we can have a very high resolution map for Africa. And I don't think that's an unreasonable ask. Are you considering in bringing in that local knowledge into the systems that you have, are building? Your indigenous knowledge. And I think uh, earlier on, we also mentioned that uh, it's for the people, by the people, I mean, for the communities, by the community, with the community. And I think this is, this is where it brings uh, all this information uh, or uh, the, the complexity in terms of uh, what policy is giving, what uh, the local knowledge is, is having. And there's a, they're at various levels. I know we at FAO, we're really looking into working directly. I mean, we are working directly with farmers in a way that to appreciate what exactly they are doing and how they have been doing it, including the livestock and the pastoralism uh, uh, land, uh, land users. Uh, for, for, so as you, you are able to really advise uh, better, but also inform uh, better in terms of if there's any modernization or any new technology coming, how can it really, you know, work with the communities? Because we all know that uh, it's good to change and to reform, and it is a whole process. Sometimes it's very, very hard to change uh, uh, ways. 
uh, for communities so easily. So you have to really, you know, be able to capacity build all the time. But actually, that's that's some of the of the things which are happening. And I think a good example will be with the maize, uh, and Caldro will attest uh, in terms of how maize was adopted uh, in Kenya and how is actually. I mean, how they are really looking forward to, you know, or working out to be able to really change the mindset against uh, maize uh, productivity, what alternatives we have, and how to really influence the communities in that. So I think that's very important, and I think that is some of the main uh, or priority ingredients when you are talking about uh, tools, you're talking about technology. So as you are able not only to inform, but also give better options if there are any, but appreciating what is already existing as local knowledge. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So um, I think we've come to the end of our session. And just to end the session, a vote of thanks to all of you for sticking through with us. Now, um, the experts are available after this session. You can meet with them. I think uh, they can all attest to the fact that they're ready to collaborate and talk to you, right? Yeah, they're ready. So thank you to the delegates and also to the Kenya Space Agency and partners who have uh, sponsored this wonderful event. I hope that we can see more of this and I think the question is not why is Africa looking to space, but why weren't we looking to space before? So thank you so much and have a lovely afternoon. Uh, okay, so there's some gifts to be awarded to the speakers. I'd like to call Mark from the Kenya Space Agency to um, award the speakers. All right. Um, on behalf of the agency and for the, the session, May I please award Ms. Nakalembe? Huh? <laughs> You'll find out what is inside later on. Okay. And on behalf of our, of our speaker, Mr. Beltran, uh, who, oh, sorry, my, my problem. Juan Suarez from, uh, from Africultures. I'd like to award this. So thank you so much. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference.